Dr. Catherine Mackey, who is a professor at UC Irvine and uh, has been in the Earth System Science Department there now for three years. And she's going to talk about our changing ocean, exploring causes, consequences, and solutions. And she assures me that there's not a single question anybody can answer that she won't be able to address. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> that's right. Of course, that's right. OK, so I'm on. You can hear me? Yeah. Good. OK, great. So I know you had my colleague Eric Grignot here before. Um, he's the new chair of the Earth System Science Department, which was founded in uh, 1995 by this gentleman, Sherry Rowland. Do any of you know who he is or why he was important? Who? And what did he discover? Uh, ozone. Exactly, the hole in the ozone layer. So I think most of us in this room are probably old enough to remember the hole in the ozone layer and what a problem that was. So I was a kid and I remember being very interested in what was driving that because I thought the environment was cool and I like to go camping. And so the idea that there was this hole in our atmosphere was terrifying to me, and I wondered what caused it. And so what Sherry Rowland discovered was that it was these chlorofluorocarbons that were going up into the atmosphere and ripping the ozone apart. This was a problem because back then, a hole in the ozone was letting UV light through. So animals and people were having higher incidences of cancer. This is an example of an environmental problem which was tractable. We solved it. It took time. Nations got together, formed the Montreal Protocol in 1989, banning chlorofluorocarbons. One of the reasons that it worked was that the companies who were making the CFCs stood to benefit by opening a new market to replace the CFCs. Right? So in addition to it being an international effort, it was also economically feasible, and people cared about it. So it was a problem that we solved through science and through international collaboration, but importantly, it's one of the most important success stories of the environmental movement because it shows that when people get together, they can solve these big problems. But today we're gonna to talk about climate change and how that's a little bit different than any problem we've seen in the past. So Eric was here. We have a department of about 25 people. He studies the ice sheets. I have colleagues who study terrestrial biogeochemistry, other oceanographers like me, people who do climate modeling. Most of them think about the Earth the first way. But this is how I think about it. You guys all probably know half of the Earth's surface is the Pacific Ocean. It's huge. And half of the other half is also ocean, about 70% of the Earth's surface. So it's a tremendous area over which climate change can affect changes to the environment, drive biogeochemical cycles, affect animals and fish, like what we just heard about. So this is what I study, and this is how I kind of think about the Earth. Now, with climate change, we have a number of different factors coming into play that can affect both the land and the water. You guys are probably familiar with the analogy of the greenhouse effect, and I won't go into too much detail other than to say that naturally, in the Earth's history, we've always had carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And what's interesting about it is that it's a heat-trapping gas, which means that solar radiation comes in through the Earth's atmosphere, warms the land, and then that gets re-radiated as radiation that's longer in wavelength. And it can't get past those heat-trapping gases. Just like if you put a blanket on when you go to bed at night, it keeps the heat from your body. This is what carbon dioxide does in our atmosphere. So naturally, we have this. But the problem is that people are putting a lot more. So it's the equivalent of putting extra blankets on. So we're glad that we have it naturally. Because without having it naturally, instead of looking like this, our Earth would look more like this, snowball Earth, which in certain times in the past we've approached. So the fact that we have natural carbon dioxide <laughs> in the atmosphere is a good thing. It makes Earth habitable for us. It means that the water is liquid, which we all need in order to live. So by adding more of it, we know that we can make it hotter because naturally the carbon has fluctuated in the past and controlled the temperatures. So when we put carbon dioxide into the air, there, there is a couple fates that can befall that carbon. Okay? About half of it can go into the ocean and the other half is going to go into the air. 
Now, I wish the animations would work, guys, sorry. So the amount that's going into the ocean versus the land is about 50-50. The plants on the land take up about half of the carbon, the ocean takes up about the other half, and the stuff that stays in the atmosphere contributes to global warming. The stuff that goes into the water contributes to ocean acidification, and I know you guys heard about that last week. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that today, too. All right, have you seen this curve yet in any of your talks? Perfect, you're all nodding. So what does it show? CO2 levels over, how were they determined? Ice cores, exactly. So this record that I'm showing is going back about 400,000 years, but really we can take the record back about a million. And the way that we do it is by digging cores into the ice. And every year, there's snow falling, and it traps little tiny bubbles of atmosphere in that core. And every year, it gets pushed further and further down. So the deeper you go into the ice, the older the air is. If we pull that up, melt it, and then measure what's in that atmosphere, we can tell what the past concentrations of CO2 were. And we can also look at the isotopes of the oxygen to tell something about what the temperature was, because the temperature of the Earth controls those isotopes. There's a couple of important features that should jump out at you. First, there's this white dashed line here. All throughout this record that I'm showing you, the level never exceeded 300 ppm. Regardless of whether we were in an interglacial, high CO2, like we're in now, where it's nice and comfortable, or a glacial period, where the CO2 is very low and the Earth is covered in ice. Regardless of whether you are there or there, you're always below 300. But look what happens in 1950s. We start to cross that barrier. And when I was in grad school, we were still below 400. And now we're well above it uh, on an annual average. This trend was first noticed by a scientist who was working in Hawaii, taking air measurements. And it was not an expected trend, but this is the one that, that popped out. Charles Keeling began in the late 50s, looking at the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And what he noticed was a gradually increasing trend. So this record is now kept up by his son, who's at Scripps, and they continue to take these measurements all the time. These measurements are also replicated in other areas of the world, too. So you can see that there's this general increasing trend. The wiggles in it represent seasonality. So we have more land mass in the northern hemisphere. So when it's our winter in the northern hemisphere, the plants drop their leaves, they get respired by microbes, the CO2 goes into the atmosphere, and you get an uptick in, the, in this wiggle. And then the opposite happens in the summer when the plants take the CO2 out. <laughs> there we go. All right. So we know that we've broken a barrier here. It's problematic. People are talking about the change that it's going to occur. We use model projections to say where it's gonna be by the end of the century. And frighteningly, our best predictions say that it's gonna be right around 750, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower. Do you know what the biggest source of uncertainty is in our climate models? Just take a guess. Population. It's related to population. <laughs> it's what the population does. It's the biggest uncertainty is what laws are we gonna pass today? to control carbon emissions tomorrow. We can't predict how climate is gonna be in the year 2100 if we don't know how much CO2 we're gonna to continue to pump over the next 100 years. That's the largest source of uncertainty is people. And the reason that we care about this is going back to those ice core records. We know that there's a very strong correlation between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature of the atmosphere. So over time, as you have increases in CO2, you tend to have increases in temperature. This is also a feedback loop. Some people ask me, well, what comes first? Does the temperature go up and then the CO2? Or does the CO2 go up and then the temperature? The answer is it's a positive feedback loop. So as the oceans warm, they do release some of the CO2, which then causes further warming, which then further warms the ocean and releases more CO2. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. Once the glacial periods start to melt and recede away, then we get into an interglacial pretty fast for that reason. What that's gonna to lead to for us is a temperature rise probably on the order of three to four degrees. The Paris Agreement was shooting for two, okay? 
It could be worse, depending on you know, humans and what we decide to do. The difference between two and four is actually quite large in terms of how much sea level rise we can predict, stratification of the ocean, which affects the chlorophyll, which is one question that was asked. Remind me to come back to that. I can talk about that a little bit. Um, but any amount of change that we have is going to cause us to re require some level of adaptation as humans. Weather patterns are going to change. Biology is going to change. So we need to understand these things. That heat has to go somewhere, all that heat that we've made. It turns out about 93% of it is absorbed into the ocean. So if people ever ask you, if global warming is real, how come it's not hotter outside this year than last year? The ocean has it. <laughs> it's all in the ocean. And the reason that that matters is because the ocean's beginning to reach its capacity for how much more warming it can take. And that warming, just like if you have a hot air balloon and you heat up the air and it expands, the same thing happens to water. So when you heat up the ocean with 93% of your heat, that's a big contributor to sea level rise. In fact, about half of the sea level rise we've seen so far is due to thermal expansion of the water. It's not due to the melting of the ice. Half of it's due to the ice. But half of it's just due to simply absorbing the heat that we're adding from putting that heat trapping gas into the atmosphere. This is bad news if you live in a place like Tuvalu, which is an island nation in the Pacific Ocean. At its highest elevation, the island is only 4.6 meters tall in, in elevation. So if I'm just under two meters tall, figure that the, the whole island is only really as tall as this room. And the vast majority of it is at sea level. So think about Superstorm Sandy or Hurricane Katrina and what happens when you have a king tide joining up with a big storm like that. The swell from the ocean is so large that this, ocean will be, this uh, island will be overtopped by the ocean. So this nation of people are going to be among the first climate refugees, which is a huge issue because these are not the people who are putting the CO2 into the atmosphere. So we have an environmental justice issue here, where we have the main emitters not feeling the brunt of the effect. There's an analogy that I like to use to talk about weather events like Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy, because one of the most con common questions that climate scientists get when we go out and give talks is, that storm we had last year, is that because of climate change? And we have to say, well, there's a difference between climate and weather, right? Weather is what happens over a period of a couple days, a couple weeks, it's short term, right? Climate is what happens over decades. And so, you can't attribute any one weather event to climate change. But there's this analogy, right? Say you went to a baseball game and you watched Barry Bonds hit a home run. And you asked your neighbor, did he hit that home run because he's on steroids? They couldn't say yes or no, because he was always able to hit a home run. That, that's why he was a baseball player. But what you can say is that the chances that he's going to hit a home run and how high he hits it and how often he hits it, those things are going to increase when he's on steroids. In the same way, climate change is like putting the weather on steroids. You can't attribute one storm or one event to climate change, but you can say that we're going to have more intense and frequent storms with climate change. Examples of those are things like hurricanes, like uh, the Superstorm Sandys that we've been seeing. At the same time, increased storm surge can flood coastal properties, causing economic damage, major damages to infrastructure that cost lots and lots of money for governments and local communities. At the same time, other areas of the globe are not getting any rain. So some places are flooding out, and others are completely dry. We're seeing patterns where our rainfall is actually changing where it falls. And then, of course, in California, Drought leads to important things like fires, which can endanger people, animals, and the economy. All of these are potential outcomes of climate change. So I know you guys already had a course on ocean acidification, but this is one of the things that my lab studies. Um, I study phytoplankton, so I'm interested in trying to understand how ocean acidification affects primary producers. So you can feel free to ask me about that. But a lot of the stuff we're going to focus on here also has to do with the effects on calcifying organisms, many of which are animals. 
So I just wanted to begin by a review of the carbon cycle because this is really the crux of how ocean acidification and CO2 uh, emissions by people into the atmosphere um, affects the Earth system. It's via the cycling of carbon and the biogeochemical processes that control that. So on land and in the ocean, the processes are pretty similar because biology evolved a long time ago and it's conserved. You have two processes, photosynthesis and respiration, that kind of determine the biological flux of carbon in and out of an ecosystem. In the ocean, you also have a solubility pump, which determines how much CO2 you can dissolve in versus how much goes out. A lot of that is determined by temperature because gases are more soluble in cold liquids than warm, which if you've ever had a warm beer, you know it's not as good as a cold beer because the bubbles come out when it's hot, right? Same thing is true of the ocean. If we start to warm up the ocean, all of the CO2 starts to degas. And then you get that positive feedback loop I was talking about where it warms, it releases CO2, causes more warming, causes more CO2, right? On land, the cycle doesn't have the solubility pump, but we do have decomposition and photosynthesis happening similarly. So just as a refresher, because this is what I study and I, I love it, this process right here that I'm describing, who can tell me the name of it? Ta-da! Right. And of course, the opposite is respiration. So biology has found a way to do both things. It can take CO2 out of the atmosphere and actually form biomass with it. That's what plants do. It's what phytoplankton do. And then on the other side, both plants and animals and microbes all do respiration. And in doing so, they take that carbon and they, they turn it back into carbon dioxide, which is then soluble and can be re-released into the atmosphere. In the ocean, photosynthesis is very similar to how it is on land. The reaction is identical. But the reason we care about it in the ocean is because it supports these vast food webs, like we just heard about in the last lecture, for example. We have these you know, impressive marine mammal communities, all like off the coast of California here, that people care a lot about. It gets them excited about the environment, makes them want to protect the environment. At the same time, there's a lot of biodiversity that's protected. Um, and then just the natural, natural appreciation for, for the balance of the ocean, too, is something of value to us. The important thing to know is that phytoplankton are actually linking the abiotic environment to the biotic environment, which means that in the ocean, all these nutrients are just floating around like salt. And these guys can't use it. Nitrogen, phosphorus, right? We need it too. The way we get it is from eating something smaller. They can actually take that salt out of the water and turn it into something usable for us. So whether it's the carbon or the nitrogen or the phosphorus, they're putting that into their cells and making it a form that we can use. So it's a really vital ecosystem function. If you ask most people to compare the productivity between the forest and the land, they say, well, what's productivity? Okay, you say, what's the photosynthetic biomass? How much of it is in these trees in the Amazon versus in the ocean? Who wants to take a guess? If you were to weigh all of the phytoplankton in the world, and you were to weigh all of the plants in the world, land plants. Well, well ocean's, much ocean's much bigger, yeah. but trees are big, too. So, how, how, what percentage of the biomass do you think these guys have? A quarter? 70? Anybody else? It's actually 99% of the biomass. But they're doing photosynthesis at the exactly the same rate, half and half. Remember I told you the land takes half the carbon, the ocean takes the other half? The difference is when these guys do photosynthesis, where do they put it? In the stem, in the leaves, it hangs around, right? It's there. When these guys do it, it gets eaten, and it goes into the fish that we just heard about. So you can weigh these guys up, and it's only about 1%, despite the fact that the ocean's so huge and they're growing everywhere. But they don't store as much carbon in the short term for that reason. The other interesting thing about this that you might not have thought about is that if they're doing half the photosynthesis, they're also making half the oxygen. So half the oxygen you breathe comes from these guys. Oh, respiration, on the other hand, everybody does it. Plants do it, animals do it, microbes do it. And in that process, they're taking that carbon in the form of biomass, and they're converting it back into CO2. And in the ocean, 
and on land too, really, the vast majority of the respiration is happening because of these guys, not because of the fish and the marine mammals. Even though they're much larger, microbes are really the ones that are driving the cycling of carbon back to carbon dioxide because of their sheer numbers and their high metabolic rates. So let's talk a little bit about how these natural processes affect the pH of the ocean. So here we have a, a little plant, here we have a sea star, and in the first process, which is photosynthesis, the plant takes up the carbon dioxide and it releases oxygen as a byproduct, that's the stuff you're breathing. And because you've removed some of the CO2 from the system, it becomes less acidic, the pH goes up. The opposite reaction is respiration. And in that case, the animal is taking up the oxygen, releasing more CO2, and that forms carbonic acid, which then lowers the pH, okay? So it's a similar effect to what happens when we put CO2 into the atmosphere. So this is, this is a known phenomenon that we understand happens naturally in the ocean. So we shouldn't be too surprised that we can do it with our emissions as well. And then finally, this slide is just to remind you that the, the ultimate fate of carbon in the ocean can befall several different pathways. Some of it is exported into the ocean's interior where it's sequestered for thousands of years, effectively removed from the atmosphere. It can't contribute to global warming anymore. But then some of it gets remineralized, which means that bacteria come in and they chew up the phytoplankton and they release that carbon and then it can kind of get outgassed again. And I mentioned before, as it gets warmer and warmer, more of that CO2 will get off-gassed back into the atmosphere. I don't know why it's not advancing. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more detail about the chemistry. So when you have a source of a gas, like we have here, going up, a gas has to go somewhere if it's reactive. And in case of carbon dioxide, we've already seen biologically it's very reactive. It's reactive in seawater too. And let's look at how that happens. So when, and I apologize for the graininess of this image, but when the CO2 dissolves into the ocean, this is a very predictable process. It's governed by something called Henry's Law. We don't need to measure it. We, we can just, we know properties of the gas. If we know the temperature of the liquid, we can tell you very precisely how much CO2 is gonna go into the water. And then it reacts with the water to form what's called carbonic acid, some of which is what you have in your carbonated beverages. And it's a, an acid that has two protons associated with it. When the first proton comes off, that contributes to acidification. And then you can have another step here, if we can find it, which will then contribute another proton. So at that step, you're actually increasing the concentration of protons in the water, which is by definition a decrease in pH, more acidity. These three things exist in an equilibrium. So it's not as though it gets dissolved, it reacts, and then it immediately releases these hydrogen ions. The pH is kind of balanced in the ocean. It's supposed to be naturally about 8.2. That's how organisms like it. It's buffered in the same way that your blood is buffered, right? The pH of your blood doesn't change very much because if it did, you would die. And in the ocean, it's the same thing. If we monkey with it, things are gonna die. So naturally it should be about 8.2, and in that case you have about a, a ratio that has a little bit of carbon dioxide in it, a little bit of carbonate, this is what the animals make their shells out of, right? So they want to have a lot of it, and the vast majority of it is the bicarbonate anion, which can be used for photosynthesis. But as you start to shift it down, 7.6 is one of the estimates of where we might end up. Look where we are now, we'd have a whole lot less carbonate. So if you're an animal or a plant, that wants to make a shell out of carbonate, now you have about half of, as much as you had before. So you struggle. We can also, using uh, the equilibrium theory from chemistry, we can predict with remarkable accuracy what the um, equilibrium solutions are for these different species of carbon in the water. This slide was generated when I was in grad school and I already told you at that time, I had this, and I used to change this number when I updated the talk, and then I thought, why? I need to tell people that in the time since I've gotten my PhD till now, which is not that long, come on, uh, <laughs> we've already had a huge increase in, in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. 
It's mind-boggling. It's above 400 now. Ten years ago, it was 380. So this is what we're seeing, a decrease in the amount of carbonate. That matters for the shell fixers, an increase in the amount of CO2, and a decline in the pH. All of those things have biological ramifications. OK, so now I wanted to do a little demo with you guys just to kind of visualize what it looks like to have ocean acidification. So if I could get like four volunteers to come up. Sure. <laughs> it's fun. So what I have here is uh, seawater that was collected from Newport Pier. It's just normal seawater. I haven't done anything to it. <laughs> that come right out here in our channel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you each a straw. Don't drink the seawater. You can open the straw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to measure the pH of the seawater. So I mentioned a minute ago the natural pH of seawater. Does anyone remember what I said it was? 8.2, 8 8.1, depends on where you are, right? We'll talk about that in a little bit, too. So I told you this came from Newport Pier. So if this is the color scale of this indicator dye, which changes color with pH, like this, what color do you think the water is going to be when I add it? You guys are better at this than my undergrads. Good. So it's nice and blue, right? And that's exactly where we would expect it to be, because it's just clean ocean water. It's uh, right from the surface of the ocean. We get upwelling here. You know, there's a lot of carbon in there. So it's, it's, it's good to go. So now what I'm going to ask you guys to do is race and see who can blow enough gas into their cup to change the color of their water. <laughs> Like that. I give my undergraduates extra credit if they win. <laughs> it's neck and neck. <laughs> How far do you guys think they can get it to go? Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's about, you can get it to be a little more yellow than that, but that's basically what, what we're at. So well, hold it up to the scale. What pH did you get your seawater to? Six and a half? See how yellow it is we have at the end if you keep blowing? Right. Thank you. You guys can set your cups down. And, uh... <laughs> so I think what we just demonstrated, yes, good job. To catch your breath. <laughs> what that experiment demonstrates is that it's possible for one human with a straw and a set of lungs to change the pH of seawater. And in analogy, that's exactly what humanity is doing with the entire ocean. It's just a much bigger straw. And instead of lungs, it's our factories and our cars and our emissions. So you can have a change happen in a cup of seawater, and it happens the same way in the ocean. Some of the biological outcomes of ocean acidification are still unknown. Part of this comes from the fact that organisms are diverse, and they've evolved a lot of different strategies to cope with stresses like acidity. Um, there's a couple different biological effects. Um, just right out of the bat, you think about calcification, things that make a shell out of calcium carbonate. They're going to be affected because the carbonate ion changes. 
But then the thing that people don't think about as often, but that I think about a lot, is photosynthesis. Because the reactant in photosynthesis, for if you're a phytoplankton, is either CO2 or bicarbonate. That's what they're taking out of the water to make new biomass in the same way that land plants are fixing their carbon. So if you're increasing the amount of CO2 and bicarbonate, you might increase photosynthesis, at least among some species, but perhaps not for all of them. We can talk about that if you think it's interesting. One important thing to know about calcifying organisms is that there's two types of calcium carbonate minerals that can form. It's, both of them have calcium and carbonate, but the structure of that crystal lattice is different, such that the ones that are made of aragonite are more soluble. It's easier for them to dissolve in a low, low pH solution. The ones that are made of calcite, which just has a slightly different structure, are much more resilient in the face of ocean acidification. So some marine animals and plants use this form, and some use that, that form. And that's the reason why we can't unilaterally predict how ocean acidification will affect all species, because they each do things a little bit differently. One example that you probably heard about in the last talk was pteropods. Did they talk about these guys? No? Oh, cool. They're beautiful. They're, they're called sea butterflies. They're, they're tiny little snails. They're pelagic. And they just kind of float around in the ocean, swim around. But their shells are made of aragonite, which means they're extra vulnerable to ocean acidification. So some of the preliminary early work done on these guys was just exposing them to CO2 levels that we expect for the end of the century over 45 days. And you can see a healthy shell ends up dissolving away. So if the animal is alive, it might be able to fight back a little bit by putting extra energy into rebuilding its shell as it dissolves. But that means that the animal has less energy to reproduce, forage for food, escape predation. So it's an, it's an ecological stress. Even if they have the physiological capability of surviving, it's very hard for us to predict what the ecological outcome will be. The other guys that I know you talked about were coccolithophores, and these are phytoplankton. So they are the ones out there fixing carbon. They're a little bit luckier. Their shells are made of calcite. So they are less prone to dissolution than the ones made from aragonite. But even among these guys, some species are very resilient, while others are not. So some of the preliminary work that was coming out, uh, even before I was in grad school studying this stuff, suggested that under normal, quote, low CO2 uh, environments, you had intact coccoliths where they, the structure was preserved. And if you grew them under high CO2, you started to see pitting and kind of deformation of the coccolith. More recent work on, on additional species has shown that not all of them follow this trend. So what does that suggest ecologically? Well, if you have a species like this dominating in a given area, they might not do too well. They could either die out and be replaced by another type of phytoplankton, or another species of coccolithophore that's more resilient could move in and take its place. Again, these are ecological questions that are really difficult to model without knowing all of the details about the ecology of the site and the biogeochemistry. And finally, coral. Coral are the big ones that people care a lot about because they are also made of aragonite, so they're very sensitive to changes in pH. But we also know that they're very sensitive to changes in temperature. So it's like a double whammy for corals, right? Not only are they being attacked by higher temperatures, but they're being attacked by lower pH too. And what we're seeing is that with increased warming events, multiple years of bleaching, it's much harder for these animals to recover when it's a sequential year after year threat. And because the climate gets warmer and warmer each year, these events are happening back to back more often. So whereas a community might be able to recover from a bleaching event that occurs one year and then not the next, now we're having back to back years and they can't really recover from that as well. Another reason that it's hard for us to fully understand what the effects of ocean acidification is going to be is that it's not easy to generalize across all of the different types of biology that could be affected. So I told you the chemistry is very well prescribed. We can calculate it. It's based on physical laws that we can measure. Biology is much more variable. So different species can actually do better under low pH. Some do worse under low pH. Some have an optimal range somewhere in the middle, right? 
So it, it's hard if we go into the lab and we study one species of copolithophore and we say, oh, they respond this way. But if we study another species, they might respond the opposite way. So it makes it very hard for us to put it into a model and predict what the outcome is going to be because the diversity is so high and the responses, the number of responses that can occur is so high and so variable. All right, so we're going to move on and talk a little bit more closer to home, bring it back to California, and talk about some of the cycles that go on here that I think are interesting. So this is a quote from a, a paper by Richard Feely, who's one of the leaders in the, the field of ocean acidification research. And he said, ocean acidification has already decreased mean surface water pH in the California coastal system to a level that was not expected to happen for open ocean surface waters for several decades. So what he's saying is, there are times of the year where here in California, we're already observing acidified water that's worse off than what we're predicting for the open ocean decades out. So what's the reason for that? Well, it comes back to our really unique system here where we have upwelling. You guys know what upwelling is? Okay, upwelling, it's, it's when all that deep water comes and rushes up along our coastline. It brings lots of nutrients with it. But as it turns out, it also brings water that's really high in carbon dioxide, therefore low pH. Can you think of why the deeper water, the stuff down at the bottom of the ocean, why would that have more CO2 in it than the stuff in the surface? That's, these are both good ideas. There's one driving factor that makes it dominant, though. Where's the CO2 in the deep coming from? So the carbon in the cells settles, but where does the carbon dioxide come from? Respiration, decay, exactly. So there's little microbes down there. Again, it comes back to the microbes, eating that carbon up and turning it from a phytoplankton cell or a piece of fish poop back into CO2. It doesn't happen like that quite as much in the surface ocean. Why? There's still respiration in the surface ocean, but what's there to counteract it? Which reaction counters respiration? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. So just as soon as the bacteria are generating the CO2, what are the little plants doing? They're taking it up and making new cells. So we don't end up having a buildup of CO2 from the biology in the surface water because you have both processes. In the deep, all you have is respiration because there's no sunlight down there. So you can't have photosynthesis. The reason that this matters for ocean acidification, if we can get to the next slide, is that when you have upwelling, that deep water that has that low pH and that high CO2 comes up along our coastline and it reaches our surface ocean. So for any shell-forming animals that live there or plants, they're going to experience a much lower pH. And this process is exacerbated by the anthropogenic CO2 that we are also adding to the atmosphere. So areas like coastal California, which have a natural biological background, of increased CO2 are the ones that are going to be hit the hardest by ocean acidification that's anthropogenic coming from our emissions. Does that make sense? Because again, you have two sources of CO2, whereas in other areas without upwelling, all you have is the human source. Some of the effects of this I'm sure you covered. We have animals that are growing smaller in size with thinner shells. They're smaller in size because they have to spend a lot more of the energy that they get from their food on rebuilding their shell. Instead of getting bigger, they're building shell, right? So this matters if you're in aquaculture or if you just study these types of shellfish and care about their well-being. This can have effects on how safe the sky is from predation, right? It's a lot easier for an animal to crack this shell open than this shell. So he has a lot of things to worry about in terms of staying safe and energy expenditure. This also has a direct translation to the amount of money that can be made from shell fishing industries, whether it's aquaculture or natural. Um, and this is really just intended to show you kind of the breakdown here. The red ones are the aragonite shells. The orange ones are calcite, so these are the ones that are less uh, dissolvable. And these are the predators, right? So you can see Crabs, they have calcite shells. It's basically impossible to hurt a crab, especially if they're well fed. They're pretty good at surviving. But when you look at things like clams and oysters and other calcifiers, especially ones that have uh, 
vulnerable juvenile life stages where the, the little baby animals are much more susceptible to low pH, this is where it starts to become a problem. And I like to use this, this kind of an older example of um, a shellfish hatchery that had problems. This was up in uh, Oregon and Washington. And what happened was they were starting to observe die-offs of some of their shellfish. So when they would put them out there as juveniles, the acidified water would come during upwelling events, like what we have in California, and they would lose part of their crop, right? And they quickly realized that it was because of that acidity issue. And so this being an important economic industry, they had to come up with a way to protect their investment. And so the solution was they built big seawalls so that they could shut their center off from the rest of the ocean, and they would use satellites to look down at the ocean to see when the upwelling was going to happen, because that upwelled water is a lot colder, and you can see that with the satellites. So the minute they would start to see upwelling happen by a, a drop in temperature, they would simply shut the doors and recycle the water that was of the appropriate pH. And then when the upwelling was done, they could open the doors again and get the fresh water back in. But clearly, that's more of a Band-Aid than a fix. Um, and ultimately, this is a problem that needs to be addressed and solved. So I'm about to wrap it up. I just wanted to bring it back to what I started with, with this idea of a tractable environmental problem, one that we solved with science and international collaboration. This was a success story. There are several factors and features of climate change that set it apart from a problem like the hole in the ozone layer. It's an existential threat that needs to be fixed more quickly. We don't have the luxury of time of waiting for a Montreal protocol to be passed, for example, the way that, that they could. There was about two decades that they had to wait between when the science was discovered and when they passed the Montreal protocol. We don't have that luxury. We just had the Paris Agreement. And even if every country that promised to participate did so as they said they would, we still won't make the two degree cutoff that we were aiming for. So it's a problem that can't wait multiple generations to be solved because the outcomes are too extreme and it's happening too quickly. The CO2 that we put into the atmosphere today stays around for many, many decades. So even if we were to stop all of our emissions right now worldwide, we would still continue to have warming for quite a while. I like to think of ways to solve this. Um, I haven't come up with a, a perfect solution yet, but I think a lot about people. In the Montreal Protocol, we had nations coming together, we had economic solutions that were viable, and we knew the science. So it was like a trifecta of, of good things coming together. And so how could we use an idea like that to inform us about climate change? And so I like this analogy of, of two people playing tug of war, right? On the one side, you've got people saying, we've got to stop climate change, we've got to stop emitting. And on the other side, you've got people saying, but my livelihood depends on it, I can't give it up, I'm going to lose too much, right? But one of the ways that you can get people to align is by finding some other value that they share and, and helping them to focus on that. So if you can imagine these people were actually standing here, if I grabbed this line in the center and started walking this way at 90 degrees, what would happen to them? They would fold up and they'd all be facing the same direction, right? They would all be aligned in their effort. They're still all pulling just as hard. It's just that I've changed the direction that they're pulling. So how do you do that? Well, you look for common ground, right? We can talk about having America be a leader in green technology, the way that we were for other technologies in the past. We can talk about you know, protecting this gift of, of pristine nature that we have. Some people really find that that language resonates with them. I think all of us can agree we don't want to leave our kids with problems that are too big to solve. right? So examples of finding common ground and projecting them to people so that they can kind of have something to grab onto that's not in opposition to their, their own values is probably the first step in making change happen. I just hope that it happens fast because this is a problem that needs to be addressed sooner than later. And so I wanted to leave you with 10 last words. If you don't remember anything else from the lecture, I hope you remember these. Climate change is real, 100%. Climate deniers may tell you otherwise, 
but it's real. It is definitely us. Not only can we measure the isotopes of the carbon, and we can measure the changes in pH, we can model it, and we know that it's us. It's pretty bad for the reasons that I showed you today. These changes are already happening, and even if we stop today, they're gonna to continue to happen for decades to come. If anybody tries to tell you that scientists are divided on this issue, they're, they're lying to you. There was a study that showed that of all the published papers on climate change, 97% of the scientists agreed that climate change was anthropogenic. People were doing it. So this perception that it's a 50-50 thing, not real. And then finally, I think that by looking outside of the box, thinking about the way that people can share values and align with what their goals are, and to the extent that we can make it economically feasible, I think that there is hope. We just have to act really quickly. Mm -hmm.